Greetings. Welcome back. It's uh, time for chapter four. We're going to talk about contact forces and how they arise and how they relate to the momentum principle. So the first thing I want to point out is that we have a model of solid materials that we're going to be developing. And you could kind of think of it as a bunch of atoms connected together by uh, bonds, which we're going to represent as little springs. So basically the chemical bonds will be thought of as little springs and uh, they're going to form a cubic lattice. Now in real materials the lattice can be somewhat more complicated. It can be a lot more complicated. But the essential features of our model of matter are all in the cubic model. The complexities that you get by going to other st crystalline structures um, are interesting, but they're, they're not fundamental. Um, so we're not going to deal with those here. If you want to take a course in solid state physics, you can get all the detail you'd like about that. I wanted to give you a sense of what it looks like as you're sort of moving through this model. The idea is that it goes on and on and on for a long way and that it repeats uh, systematically and reproducibly. There's a constant distance from one atom to the neighboring atom and there's a spring constant that exists between neighboring atoms and it's always the same. So let's talk about those atomic bonds. The idea is they behave like a spring. So if you, if the atoms are at their natural distance apart, if, if there are no forces acting on the material, then there will be a certain distance between neighboring atoms. And if you, uh, if you try to stretch them, they'll produce a force that tries to pull them back. If you try to compress them, they'll produce a force that pushes back. So they're always trying to get back to their unstretched condition. The actual physics of what's going on, of course, is that there's a, a nucleus and an electron, uh, sometimes many electrons, that interact with one another in, in order to form this sort of um, behavior, to develop this behavior. And for as long as you don't squeeze the thing too much, it's a pretty good approximation to treat it as a simple spring. If you look at the real material, you can see that it ends up looking something like this. This is an actual atomic force microscope image of atoms from a crystalline solid. And you can see that it looks just about like our model. So it's not so bad. Let's talk about density. Density is the, uh, the amount of mass per unit volume in a material. If the atomic separation is about the same for different kinds of materials and the atomic mass is basically proportional to the atomic number. So we, by making some simple assumptions, we can uh, develop a connection between the microscopic properties of the atoms, the distance between the atoms and the amount of matter contained in the atoms, to macroscopic properties that you can measure easily in the laboratory, like density. And the idea, of course, is that the density is the mass per unit volume. So you can see looking at the picture that the mass enclosed in that little cube is the mass of a single atom. And the volume of the little cube, the volume that's sort of associated with that atom, is simply the cubic distance between neighboring atoms. So let's see how that works out. Let's, let's look at copper. Copper has an atomic weight of about 64 grams. That means one mole of copper has a, has a mass of 64 grams. They call it molar weight, but the, really what they mean is mass. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, another way to think about it is that the nucleus of copper has 64 nucleons, and um, that means that uh, the mass of one copper atom is 64 times the mass of a nucleon of a approximately 1.7 or so times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. The density of copper is going to be the mass of one atom divided by the volume of one atom because the whole notion is that the atoms distribute themselves in a way that each of them gets the same volume and the overall density is just the density associated with one particular atom. So you can, uh, you can compute the mass of an atom by dividing the mass of a mole of copper by Avogadro's number, or you can multiply the mass of a nucleon by the atomic weight, uh, the atomic number, uh, ah, atom molar weight, I guess, is the best way to say it. <coughs> okay, in this case it's 64. So if you calculate that out, you get a density 
of 89,400 kilograms per cubic meter. Actually, you could just go look this number up or you could measure it in the laboratory and then you can work it backwards to get the uh, volume occupied by a single atom and then you could take the cube root of that volume to compute the size of the cube, the side size of the cube, which is the distance between neighboring copper atoms. So you can see that by by starting with the density and knowing the relationship between the atomic mass and the volume of the cube in which the atomic mass lives, we can go back and get the distance between atoms. Let's talk about the bond stiffness. Uh, in class we measured the uh, stiffness of a macroscopic spring hanging at the front of the room and you guys all told me how you thought it would go when I hung two springs together end to end and then we did the same thing with two springs side by side and so on and we discovered that the spring constant of two springs hung end to end was um, less than the spring constant of the two springs individually and uh, in the case of two equal springs it was the spring constant of one spring divided by the number of springs in the chain. And when we hung them side by side, you discovered that the spring constant was double. If you take two equal springs and hang them side by side, the effective spring constant of the combination is double. And then we wanted to generalize that a little bit to talk about well, what happens if we have a long chain of springs all connected together and then neighboring chains connected together side by side. And what we decided was that the uh, long chains would be have a spring constant equal to the spring constant of one of the springs divided by the number of springs in the chain and the side-by-side -side chains would have an effective spring constant of the number of chains times the spring constant of a single chain. So let's write that all down. If you take springs end to end and you think of the spring constant between neighboring atoms as the intrinsic bond strength and your textbook calls that Ks comma I, the intrinsic bond strength divided by the number of bonds would be the spring constant of one chain. And then the spring constant of the material, if you think of a macroscopic wire, is a bunch of, bunch of chains hung side by side. To get the spring constant of the entire wire, that would be the spring constant of a single chain times the number of chains that are dangling there side by side. That's the idea. Now the number of bonds is the length of the wire divided by the bond length and the number of chains is the area, the cross-sectional area of the wire, divided by the area occupied by one chain which is just d squared. So if you take those expressions for the number of bonds and the number of chains and plug them back into our expression for the spring constant, you get the interesting result that the spring constant of a macroscopic wire is the bond strength times the number of chains divided by the number of bonds in a single chain. And if you put in what we worked out based on the length of the wire, the area of the wire, and the bond length, the distance between neighboring atoms, then you get the final result that the spring constant is the bond strength between neighboring atoms divided by the distance between neighboring atoms times the ratio of the area of the wire to the length of the wire. That's how it works out. Now, if you plug in numbers for copper, as your textbook does uh, in the section where it goes through a little example, you'll see that it comes out to about 27 newtons per meter. In other words, the bond strength of neighboring atoms is sort of a typical spring constant for a macroscopic spring. It's very interesting. Now let's talk about Young's modulus. If you go look in the, uh, what is it called? It's the uh, Handbook of Chemistry and Physics. And you look for bond strength of bonds in copper or aluminum or some elemental solid, you probably won't find it. What you're going to find is something called Young's modulus. Young's modulus is a uh, intrinsic property of materials that is measured in terms of macroscopic distortions and forces and so on that are exerted on and by materials. Um, if you define the stress to be the force per unit area that's acting on a material and you define the strain as the change in the length of the material divided by the length, so it's the fractional change in length of the material, Young's modulus is defined as the stress per unit strain.
And the interesting thing about that is because the uh, force and the displacement or the stretch are sort of proportional to one another, it turns out the stress divided by the strain is independent of the particular macroscopic geometry of the material. It doesn't depend on the length of the wire, it doesn't depend on the cross-sectional area of the wire, it just depends on intrinsic properties of the material itself. In this case, we're talking about copper. So the stress divided by the strain. Now notice that you could rearrange this and turn it into something that looks a lot more like Hooke's Law by solving for the force of tension acting in the material. And you'll notice that that's proportional to the elongation or the change in length of the material. You could think of the change in length as the stretch and the force that's applied as a sort of uh, tension. And then the fact that they're, e they're proportional to one another means that we have a spring-like behavior, but the spring constant uh, is Young's modulus times the cross-sectional area divided by the length. But if you go back and, uh, and look at our old expression that we cooked up for the spring constant of a piece of wire like this, that the, uh, the Young's modulus fits in to this expression exactly the same way that the interatomic bond spring constant and the distance between neighboring atoms fits into the expression we worked out using the microscopic properties of the material. And so, in fact, that is Young's, con Young's modulus. Young's modulus is nothing other than the interatomic spring constant divided by the distance between neighboring atoms. So that's a neat connection. Uh, Young's modulus is an intrinsic property of material that's derived by macroscopic displacements and forces, and the uh, we just worked out how it depends on the microscopic properties of the material itself. Pretty neat. Let's talk about contact forces. If I set something down on a surface, the surface is going to push back. If you look at that on an atomic scale, what, what it basically boils down to is that uh, when when a force is applied to a material, the interatomic bonds shorten a little bit, and because they're shortening, those interatomic bonds push back with a force that's proportional to the uh, change in the distance between neighboring atoms, and you end up with a contact force. So if you set a brick down, for example, on a table, the table pushes up, the earth pulls down, but on a microscopic scale, what happens is the table surface actually deforms, the interatomic bonds are compressed, and those compressed bonds push back up on the brick in order to produce a macroscopic normal force. So there's a microscopic origin to a macroscopic normal force. Um, another kind of problem we run into a lot in this chapter are situations where things are stationary, and I want to connect that back to the momentum principle. If you have a brick sitting on a table, the net force acting on the brick, if it's just sitting there, must be zero because the momentum of the brick is constant. And that means that if there are multiple forces acting on the brick, or whatever, that the sum of those forces must be zero. So we're going to deal with some problems in this chapter where you have objects whose momentum is constant, and as soon as you recognize that you're dealing with a constant momentum situation, you can immediately conclude that the sum of the forces acting on that object has to be zero. So uh, the laboratory we're going to do today and the modeling exercise we're going to do on Wednesday deal with spring mass systems. So you've got a mass on a spring with some momentum if it's moving. Its velocity is the rate of change of its position. Let's imagine we're just going to deal with the one-dimensional motion for the moment. We know the rate of change of the momentum is the net force in the x direction. And the momentum principle tells us that um, that's equal <coughs> to the mass times the second derivative of position with respect to time. Remember that the velocity is the first derivative of position with respect to time, and therefore the rate of change of the velocity is the second derivative that's also called the acceleration. So we get that the mass times the acceleration is minus a constant times the displacement. If we measure if we set our coordinate system up so that x measures the distance from, or the displacement from equilibrium, then we get an equation that looks something like this. Now the question is, what kind of functions have the behavior 
that the second derivative of position with respect to time of the function of time is minus a constant times the function again. And we talked about this in class. You guys figured out the answer without my having to tell you. I'll remind you. It turns out to be nothing other than the sines and cosines. So um, they look something like this. You're familiar with them. I just want to point out that uh, if you assume that the displacement as a function of time goes like a cosine, the velocity goes like a sine, and the acceleration goes like minus omega squared times the cosine back again. So you get an acceleration that's minus omega squared times the displacement. But remember, the original um, problem was that the second derivative of x with respect to t was minus k over m times x, and so you can identify omega squared with k over m. So that tells us that the omega, that turns out to be a, a number with units of frequency, 1 over time, uh, it has to be nothing other than the square root of k over m. Finally, uh, I want to point out, not, not actually not quite finally, we have a, one more slide after this, but uh, it turns out if there's a disturbance in our model of a chain of atoms, and uh, that disturbance tends to propagate because if you compress the distance between 1 and 2, 2 pushes on the spring between 2 and 3, and that compresses, and then the string between 3 and 4 compresses, and so on. And by dimensional analysis, we know that uh, the only way to form a velocity out of the properties of the material are to use uh, the distance between atoms and this thing that we cooked up that has units of 1 over time, um, it depends only on the inner atomic bond strength and the mass of neighboring atoms. So uh, this is not at all any kind of derivation of the wave speed, but it hopefully is a plausible argument that uh, th the, only th the only thing you can form that has units of um, velocity that includes the bond strength, the mass of the atom, and the distance between atoms is this particular quantity. And uh, it could, you could have a 2 or a pi or something in there, and it would still be uh, legitimately with the correct units. But uh, it turns out this is, in fact, the correct answer. And uh, if you're interested in how this comes about, we can chat about that on the side. But, uh, but this does turn out to be correct. And the nice thing is it's fairly intuitive. We know that the uh, omega is the frequency with which a, a mass an atomic mass would wiggle if it was connected to a spring with the bond strength. So that's kind of how fast things wiggle. And the wiggle propagates at a, a distance, um, something like the distance between atoms. So it, it goes kind of like the wave speed is the distance between atoms, sort of like divided by the time of one wiggle. Um, that's not exactly right, but that's sort of intuitively what's going on. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. The, uh, the last bit I want to share with you guys is the idea of static and kinetic friction. Let's say I have a block uh, that's not sliding. It's sitting at rest on a surface, and I, um, I know that the earth is going to pull down on the block, and I know the surface is going to push up on the block. And because the block is not uh, accelerating, it's, it, doesn't, it has no rate of change in momentum, those two forces are going to cancel. And then I apply a force. It turns out if the force I apply is not too big, the material will resist permitting that thing to move. You can imagine on a microscopic scale, you're trying to push these atoms around and they're going to push back. And that pushback is called uh, friction. And in this case, it's called static friction because the thing is not actually sliding. The force of static friction is whatever it takes to keep the thing from sliding but there's an upper limit to what that can be. And so the relationship we're going to learn in this class is that the force of static friction is less than or equal to a number times the normal force. The normal force is the force, the, the compression force pushing back up on the block because it's, it's compressing the mattress. Okay, it's like, a, I, I think of it as a mattress force. And the, uh, the frictional force is a sideways don't slide on me force that prevents the <coughs> excuse me the block from sliding and the uh, the point is there's a maximum value the force of static friction can have and it turns out to be proportional to the normal force the greater the normal force is the greater force you need 
um, the greater force the, the surface can produce to prevent sliding. And the proportionality constant between that maximum force the surface can produce and the normal force is called the coefficient of static friction. It's that mu sub s thing down there at the bottom. Next, uh, if we have an object that is uh, sliding, okay, it's sliding along with some non-zero velocity. Again, we have the weight. Again, we have the normal force. We could have a applied force or we might not have an applied force, but the point is the thing is sliding to the right in this picture. The velocity is to the right. So now there's an opposing force, and it's called the force of kinetic friction. And there's no inequality here. Experimentally, it's found that the force is proportional to the normal force. And the coefficient of kinetic friction is that constant of proportionality. And that's the whole thing for today. I'm sorry it was a little bit rushed, um, but uh, I had to get it out. And so here it is. Hope you enjoy.